Yeah, um, since they were thrown to have auto trackout, and the particular standard part. Um, so auto is an assistant professor at Boston University Center for Computing and Data Sciences, and a fellow at the Eric and Wendy Smith Center of the Broad Institute of the IT Department. Um, he obtained his PhD uh, with Mike Jordan and Peter Barnett at CUC Berkeley. Uh, that's where Arlo and I first met. And, um, to this day, Arlo has still been perhaps the most creative student coming up with, coming up with problems and creative ways. Um, so afterwards, uh, Arlo was a postdoc researcher at Microsoft Research in New York. His research lies in the areas of reinforcement learning, online learning, embedded, and algorithmic affairs. He's particularly interested um, in furthering our statistical understanding of learning phenomena in adaptive environments and use those theoretical insights and techniques to design efficient and safe algorithms for scientific engineering and large scale style applications. Uh, but without further ado, let's hear it from Caldo and himself. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, I guess. And thanks for being here. So I'll talk to you today about. Um, something called the dissimilarity dimension and how this statistical concept that we introduced in very recent work can give us sharper bounds for optimistic algorithms. This is, uh, I'll define all of these terms as we go along. So if you didn't understand what I just said, do not worry, it'll, it'll be explained. This is joint work with fantastic authors here listed, uh, Natalie, Miro, and Rob uh, from my time at, at Microsoft. And this appeared at NeurIPS this year. The title of the paper is this, and I'll talk about a portion of the paper. It's not the whole set of contributions of that work, but my favorite one. So I'll talk about uh, what I call here adaptive learning. This is a scenario that is different from, as you may aware, be aware supervised learning, where you have an agent or a system that's interacting sequentially with the world. So the agent may not know in advance everything about the world, so it has to at the same time as uh, learning about it, make decisions. And usually in these scenarios, what you care about is to make decisions, to learn about the world and maximize a reward function. Um, so these are, uh, I didn't have a slide of that, but like these are scenarios such as, for example, when we do scientific experimentation, you may want to learn what kind of experiments to run uh, to achieve a particular objective. Uh, so in advance, you don't know the data that will come out of an experiment before you run it. So you want to decide, design a very ef efficient way of running your experiments to collect information and achieve your objectives. Another paradigmatic example is, let's say, robotics. You have a robot that you want to train in the world to solve a particular task. So at the beginning of time, the robot has not interacted with the environment, and it wants to uh, solve the task you wanted uh, to solve. So it'll, it'll interact and learn at the same time as trying to achieve its objective. So these are paradigmatic examples of adaptive learning. But the thing we're, we are concerned about here is to ask questions about sample complexity. So how many deployments do we need to, to have of the system collecting data in the world to find a good solution? So why this is interesting or how does this relate to other scenarios such as say supervised learning? So in, in things that supervise learning, uh, this kind of question of sample complexity from a sort of statistical viewpoint, how many samples you need to find a good solution, um, can be characterized by notions such as a VC dimension and perhaps other notions in the same classification and in some other scenarios, other kinds of statistical dimensions. So what we're going to ask is sort of the same kind of question. Do, does it exist a particular notion of statistical dimension that we can come up with to uh, upper bound the number of samples that we need in adaptive learning scenarios to find a good solution. Okay, so that's sort of what we're trying to, to, to do, but we'll do it in a very uh, specific kind of scenario that I really like, which is called bandits. So in, in a bandit sort of uh, uh, setting, what you have is you have a sequential interaction between a learner and the world that goes in time steps. So think of it as, um, a patient is interacting with you and you want to propose a particular medical treatment. So here we're going to call the treatment, for example, an arm. And then when we run the treatment on, let's say, this patient, uh, we collect a reward, which in this case, think of it as, let's say, whether the treatment succeeded or not. This, of course, also 
feeds into the other settings I described, such as scientific experimentation. Uh, you, you are interacting in, in time steps. You are the experimenter. You want to select what experiments to run, what type of experiment to run for like the objective you want to see. And you want to collect a reward, whether let's say your experiment did, uh, succeeded or not. Okay, so why it's called bandits is because from all the, well, the, the sort of, the setup, the bandit setup, is such that for all alternative treatments here, you only get to see the value of the reward for the treatment that you actually uh, tried out and not for everything else, okay? And uh, in the scenario we're going to talk about, which is called um, structured bandits, we're going to think of the following formalism. So we have a set of arms, which is, let's say in this case, the medical treatments we have access to. And we're going to assume the, the mean reward, so the probability of success, like in this scenario, you know, the reward there could be random, but there is a mean value of that reward, which we're going to assume that can be modeled as a function that lives in some function class. So right now, think of it as, as an arbitrary function class. The objective of this, uh, you know, what we come up with in this work is to think about if I give you an arbitrary function class, how many samples do you need to learn? A good action. Okay, so paradigmatic. I will come to the examples of what kind of paradigmatic function classes you may think about, and how that can be extended. So what you want to find out here is to interact with the world, pulling arms. We call it pulling arms, fine treatments, collecting rewards which are randomized, which are random. Sorry, and uh, eventually you want to find out what is the optimal arm. So the, the treatment that maximizes the probability of success. Okay, so but think of right now as this F has been arbitrary. So I'll give you examples where it's not arbitrary, but the goal here is to understand what happens if F is completely arbitrary. How expensive or how many samples do I need to find a good R? And as I mentioned, uh, we're going to think of the noisy scenario where you have the reward you collect when you pull an arm to be equal to the mean reward, which this is unknown to the learner, plus some zero mean noise. I'll just repeat the last thing. Uh, so this F star, of course, you don't know it in advance, right? So that's kind of the whole point. You're interacting with a system where there's a mean reward that you don't know, and you get randomized samples such as these ones when you try out uh, an arm. So again, the question is how many samples you need? <clears throat> Um, right, so this, this is a bit in more detail than the previous slide that I had. So this is the setting of structure bandits, structure, because you know, I have this kind of structure F, uh, where at each time step, the learner selects an arm, then he collects a reward, did the treatment succeed or not. As, as I mentioned, uh, there is a mean reward function, which we don't know, but we know this function class. Okay, could be arbitrary. I'll give examples where this is linear or this is multi arm bandits but I'll define them in a second. And just, you know, these are some references of papers that first introduced this kind of setup and that have been studying this setup in more detail of, you know, arbitrary function classes. So just, uh, you know, I've been talking about finding an optimal arm and, and uh, finding a good treatment, right? So in this work, and this, this need not be the only measure of performance that you may, may encounter in the literature, we'll think about uh, how to evaluate the performance of a learner that is interacting with this system via the following quantity that's called regret. So regret is during the, the interaction of the learner with the world, which happens in big T rounds, we're going to compute, but this is something you cannot, like the learner cannot actually compute as it goes because it doesn't know F star and it doesn't know alpha star, but this is a measure of performance of that learner without, I guess, the learner knowing. Uh, so it's this quantity that is equal to the difference between the maximum reward the learner could have obtained, the mean reward, had it played the optimal arm, minus the mean reward of the arm that it selected. Okay? So the objective in lots of these uh, algorithm design questions in bandits and, and so on, and reinforcement learning and all these scenarios is to, in many cases, define, um, find an algorithm that has a sublinear regret. Sublinear means that this quantity, you want it to grow not linearly with t, as 
perhaps as a function like square root p times some quantity. And what we are concerned about here is to, when you have, you want to assign algorithms here that look like square root p, big t, times a quantity that corresponds to the complexity of learning for the specific function class you're interacting with. And we want to characterize that quantity. Okay, so at the beginning, I was talking about like finding the optimal arm. So I just want to say that that's a bit of a different problem, finding the optimal arm versus minimizing regret. But they're very related. Okay, so we'll focus on regret and that's going to be our measure of performance in this work. So perhaps they, okay, so I'll, I'll come back to a little bit of history. So perhaps the most well-known scenario in when you talk about bandits is what is called multi-arm multi bandits. So this is uh, a setting where you have uh, K arms, so K alternatives, K treatments. I'll, I'll tell you about it. why is it called bandits in a second, but and what you want to uh, do is you interact with these alternatives by selecting them, collecting random rewards, and you want to minimize, for example, the regret in this scenario. So in this case, if the mean rewards are these quantities, let's say these are the values, arm two is the optimal arm. And you want to compete as you interact with this setting, with this uh, problem, with the best arm, the, the red one. So why this is called bandits is because this scenario is inspired by thinking about slot machines, which are actually called, so this is a one arm bandit. So a slot machine is, uh, you know, this randomized machine that when you try it out, it may give you money or not. So this is kind of a similar scenario as if you have an arm that with some probability will give you a reward and some probability won't. So what you care about here is sort of the, whether the mean, estimating the mean reward. And so, so in this kind of scenario was so first introduced by Robbins in 1952, right? So it, it's kind of a very long standing uh, model for these kind of interactions. Uh, and so how does this tie to what I was uh, describing before in the more abstract scenario is that if you consider F, the function class, the arbitrary function class I described of payoffs, mean payoffs as just identified with, for example, zero one to the K. So this captures these kind of uh, settings, okay? Is, is there any question here? Like why this captures the multi-arm bandit um, scenario? So I guess every time you have just some zero and one sequence to this one. Yeah, so I mean like, you know, so you have the mean, so if the mean reward is a point in like zero one to the K, that means that, you know, the mean rewards, so the F stars of each of the arms, is just uh, you know a point in zero one, right? So you can identify the multi embedding scenario as one as a setting where the the functions, so the f star, is identified as a point in zero one to the k. Okay. So this this more abstract scenario, of course, subsumes multi embedded by just setting it to this to this quantity. So one thing that happens in this scenario, let me right. So let me. I was getting ahead of myself. So one thing that happens in a multi bandit scenario is that um, when you try out an arm, you don't learn anything about another arm, right? So here, if I try this arm here and I get like rewards from it, I, if I don't try arm two, I, I cannot know at all like the mean reward of that arm or anything about it, okay? But uh, there are scenarios and maybe I'll, where instead, you may have, for example, that the mean rewards can be represented as, say, a linear function of some features. Okay, this is this is something very reasonable. You may want to assume or may hold in practice. Uh, and so, in this in these cases, uh, it is a case that if I try a particular arm, then I actually learn something about the mean reward of another one. Right. So, for example, here, if there is no noise. I only need two queries because they are two dimensional, two queries of independent, linearly independent arms to learn the theta star and then learn exactly what F star is. Whereas if I had the same problem with five arms, but it was a multi embedded scenario, I, I need five queries to figure out exactly which one it is. So going, going backwards here, what it means is that if I have an assumption on 
um, the function class that has some structure, that may reduce the query complexity, provided that, of course, that structure is true in the problem I'm encountering in, in reality, right? Which is I was what I was saying here about the linear case. Um, so you know, so an other other kind of assumption you may you may want to make is that let's say you have uh, something like let's say this wedge class, right? So that's something that is possible, uh, and I'll come back to this kind of class later on because it will appear in some examples. But you know, this is another kind of forget the spice level. This used to exist in another way. So, some kind of example I had. A previous iteration of these uh, slides, but so yeah, this is some other kind of function class that you may be interacting with. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So the question, the, right? So the question here is, would this reduce the complexity? Right. So one thing that happens here is like if you know you're in a wedge class scenario, let's say this, uh, you know this one with zero, the flat part. That's the example I'm going to give you afterwards. So if you query an arm and you get a zero, okay, you know you're in the flat part. If you query an arm and you find some slope, you can, well, I guess you need to kind of query twice, but you can start figuring out where in the wedge you are. So you kind of need like, I guess, not that many queries to identify the two slopes. And then that tells you basically where, like the shape of the wedge. And forget the five, because maybe, a better example is suppose I let you play any arm, so any like query these functions anywhere between zero and one. So here clearly, I mean you don't need to query everything. So if you know the width of the of the wedge, you can query at sort of these intervals that are roughly the width of it until you find out this wedge part, and then you learn the wedge. So this will come back later on. I just wanted to introduce the wedge class because I'll talk about it later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. Yeah, so in this specific case, yeah, yeah. So this is sort of like an assumption that's baked in in the structure itself of F. And what we'll come uh, to talk about is how, for if I give you F, you know, you know the function class. For that function class, what is sort of the sample complexity for it? So, so you can leverage stuff about f and about a and and so on. So, so that's fine. Uh, if that makes sense, I don't know. If... Yeah, I guess here because you have a, like previous structure. Yeah. Like... yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we'll basically say see at some point is that the class of algorithms I'll talk about, which are called optimistic algorithms, basically leverage that Euclidean structure of like right no no I mean yeah it's just like this is actually kind of a nice class yeah that's good thanks a lot so um right so when I say throughout this talk function approximation I just mean like we're not assuming a multi-arm banded setting or not or not even a linear one we're just thinking about you have some arbitrary function class f that you know that contains the F stack. Okay, so you know things that F could be are, as we mentioned, linear things, quadratic, the wedge class, maybe an RKHS, multi bandits, and uh, but what we are assuming is that F star it is is in F, so it is realizable. We call it All right. Okay, so let me see how much wait. Right, so the question we're going to ask and try to answer, or you know, provide some better answers to, is how to capture the complexity of structure bandits optimization, regrets optimization, for arbitrary function classes F. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a statistical quantity that depends on F, because you know it of course depends on F, that will capture um, that complexity for certain class of algorithms that is very important, that's called optimistic algorithms. And the old uh, statistical dimension that existed that would work in these scenarios for arbitrary function classes was called, or is called, eluder dimension. And what we introduce is something called the similarity dimension. It's uh, one of my favorite things in the world. So the first thing is 
what, what are we going to talk about? So first, I'll, I'll talk about what optimism means. So it's an algorithmic design principle for bandage reinforcement learning that is pervasive in the field. And what we are going to then do is define, uh, well, for this specific algorithm that works with optimism, and we'll define the sample complexity that I talked about, the similarity dimension, and show how this one can give you sharper bounds than a looser dimension when analyzing this kind of optimistic algorithms. So what is optimism? I love optimism, so uh, hope you do after as well. So there is something called the author confidence bound algorithm or UCB that is perhaps the most famous algorithm that you may encounter in multi bandits. So to introduce the algorithm, let me define a few, a, a, a little bit of notation. So the first thing is I'll use the notation F hat TA to define. So let's say we're interacting with a multi bandit problem and we pull uh, arm A. So there are K arms. We pulled it NTA times. Okay. So this algorithm has been like interacting with these arms or with this problem and it pulled arm A NT times. That's the notation I'll use. So at time t, it has tried n t times. And the average reward that he has seen for that arm is going to be called f hat t. All right? This is just notation. OK. The empirical average, yeah. The empirical average. All right? Any questions on? I tried to minimize notation. So OK, so first thing is a little bit of probability. Um, that has to do with confidence intervals. So let's say I have arm three and I have computed the empirical average FD of arm three at time t. So what you can show is that if you consider the following quantities, F hat plus dt, where dt is an interval of roughly square root one over nt, the number of times you have played that arm, and you sum it or you subtract it, then with high probability, there's a log, I'm, I'm omitting the logs. Okay. But with high probability, you can show that this quantity u offer bounds f star. Okay. Now, the nice thing is that, uh, that the second observation is that the difference between the ut quantity, so the upper bound that we can compute using the empirical averages plus the, the confidence band radius minus f star is at most this. This is because so this one, the, when you subtract the radius, this one always lower bounds, F, F star. So F star is always in the band of two times dt of the u1, the ut. Okay, so but probably all that's going on is that what I want to draw attention to is that this difference is going down at a rate that goes a square root of one over the number of times you have tried out that R. Okay? So just remember these facts that UT always upper bounds F star with high probability, and that the difference, the estimation error of UT minus UT is the minus F star goes down at a one over root T rate, root NT. So the upper confidence bound algorithm or UCB is very simple. What we do is just, we compute the UT values at every time step for all the arms, and then we pick the arm that has the largest one. That's UCB, okay? So let's analyze it. So first, what's optimism? So this algorithm is called optimistic because the value of UT at the arm that was pulled always upper bounds the, 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 optimal, the optimal arm value. So that is because, so this is the optimal arm. So I'll do my picture. This is the optimal arm. So the mean reward is here. The UT value is always bigger than its mean reward for that arm. But we're going to pick the UT, the arm, UT of AT is going to be that of the UT that's largest. So in particular, UT AT, this one, in this case, this is bigger than UT of A star, which in turn is bigger than the mean value of A star. So that's what optimism means, that the estimation, the UT estimation of the arm that I'm selecting is bigger than the optimal 
reward path. And what we can show, well, what people have shown, what we can show is a regret bound of square root kt. So interestingly, this is the first time that this sort of appeared was in 1985, which in some ways is kind of late. If you, you may believe it's kind of late, I guess. And there have been sort of claimants for the first time something happened in each of these cases in up to 2002. So not that long ago, in some ways. But this is the proof. So how do we use optimism? What we do is the regret is just this quantity. We just define it at the beginning of the talk. This is just the definition. Then because of optimism, this is upper bounded by this. And because of the vanishing error, this minus this is of order one over root t, root n t. Now these quantities, as you go, you take t larger, they're going to sum to something small, something sublinear, because it's a sum of square root one over t. So yeah, so you can do some math and show that you know this sum over one over the counts, square root of that, like if you do some magic with sums, uh, you can write it like this, like sum over each of the arms of one over L, from L equals one to the times you have to play that arm. And that you can also show easily that it's at most square root two, because each one of these sums to at most square root, roughly square root T. Yeah, more careful, you can get the root key, root key. So this is a, uh, right, so as I mentioned, so this is the principle of optimism for multi arm bandits. And it is uh, one of the most important principles, I guess, algorithmic design principles in, uh, in the bandit literature. And you can see it in the many, many titles and many, many papers that rely on it to provide results for, for these problems. And you know, this includes also reinforcement learning and so on. So now let's talk a little bit about what does this mean in the case of function approximation when we have arbitrary function classes, right? That was our original goal. So for that, we're going to use instead of just UCB, uh, something called optimistic least squares. But the, but the idea is very, very similar, okay? So as I mentioned before, in the function approximation regime, we have a function class F that's arbitrary. And F star, the true mean reward value function, is in this class. Okay, so what we'll do is we're going to do least squares. So given the data that the algorithm has collected so far up to time t, t minus one, an indexing, uh, we're going to just fit the F in the arbitrary function class that fits the data the best, the you know, actions and rewards we have observed. Uh, with a square loss, okay? So that's what this square means here. And the, the nice thing is that if you do this, you can show that, uh, you know, we have probability, you can do a similar thing as in UCB. You can show that F star, the true mean reward function, lies in a subclass and a subset of F uh, that we can compute, okay? We have probability. Yeah, that makes sense. So we can we compute an f hat, and f hat will define a subset of functions in in f that contains f star with hyperbolas, and that subset is the following. So is a set of functions in f in big F such that the square loss is less than some quantity. That, for example, in the case where the rewards are noiseless, it's just zero. So that would be because in that case, if this was the true mean reward, then we just need to find F that such that F of A was exactly this, right? That that would be that set contains F star. Right? And in, in the case where you have noisy rewards, and uh, let's say F is finite, you can you can set B, this beta T radius. Of the square uh, radius between the regression value and like the f's that remain to be of the order of log f. Okay. And I guess if it's not finite, you can also do a covering argument and you know there are uh, other quantities you can use if, if you are beyond the finite. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go to the next slide. 
So what happened, right? So now what we can do is we can compute an FP set that's, that is a subset of big F that contains F star. So we're going to use that to define confidence intervals. So how, do, how can we define UT, right? So the idea is just simply to, for any action A, we're going to define the upper confidence bound to be the maximum value that that action may achieve within the set of F that remain. Okay. So here the, the range is a little bit. And yeah. you want to maximize. Yeah. Yeah. For a fixed action, right? So for any action, you pick the function within the functions that are possible. So maybe another way of thinking about this is this is the set of functions that could have could be F star as far as we know. Right? So this is the maximum possible value that R A may achieve at the F star, right? And so the, the algorithm is the same, right? So you compute this F tilde, sorry, F F T. You compute for each action the upper confidence bound. And then play the action that maximizes it. Okay, we're good. We're good. And uh, so again, optimism holds, right? Because because of the same kind of reasoning as before, UTAT is going to be bigger than F star, well, UTA star, which is bigger than I should have written all that, but which is bigger than F star A star. So in particular, this is true that the the optimistic upper confidence bound value of the action that I'll play always upper bounds the maximum reward. And that's just because F star is in F. So here I get the function for the UT distribution. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, just like the noise distribution of the rewards here, RL, you know, it's subcaution that gives rise to this kind of confidence ball of functions in F in F. And, and then, you know, provide the confidence. So all we're using here is this property. So provided this holds that in my confidence set, FT, that F star lives in my confidence set of functions, this choice, like, you know, as defined by that, uh, is that is true. So optimism. Holds. And then, okay, so here we're just going to define what, we, what I call here an optimistic mode. So for AT, the action that we are selecting, we're going to, let, let's use the notation FT to define the model that achieves the arc max for U. Okay, so here there is like, for UT, AT, UT is the max F in this one of, fu of function values. So FT is just the, the model that achieves this one. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a model that lives in FT that could be F star that has the largest value possible for the optimistic R. Okay, so how do we prove a bound? So what we can do is the same thing. So the sort of proof uh, template is sort of the same as I described before. Regret is just this. We can use optimism to substitute this alpha star by UTAT. Now UTAT is just this model is sort of like weakness model at a, a T. So now here what you have is like F T minus F star evaluated at sort of A T. Okay. So wait. Okay, I didn't I didn't write more. But basically how we can then show a bound is by trying to bound these kind of formulas. This F star and F T live in the confidence set of F T's. And we can try to, to bound how the difference of values at these actions that we are playing of models in the confidence set is decreasing in through time. And what ends up happening is to bound that, you need to, the complexity of F of the original function class will show up. Yeah, in the noise list. Right, in the noise test case, what will end up happening is that you can drive this down to, um, so basically the, the, this difference, the upper bound of these differences can be upper bounded by some constant, which is exactly our dimension, the, the dimensions I'm talking about. 
And in the noisy case, you always have some extra error. So you so you can only open bound these things to something that looks, and I'll describe those bounds in a second, but that looks like square roots, the dimensions, the statistical dimension of the class, log f, so the, the noise, and t. So when there is noise, you, you have to pay a root t times the statistical dimension of the complexity of the class itself. Um, but when there is no noise, you only pay the complexity of the class. Yeah, I guess the question is yeah. also about sort of how do you choose this component, uh, which relates to the probability that I Right. Well, there, I mean, so I guess the recipe is just like log f, right? I mean, you can also use uh, like covering numbers if like f is infinite. So, but you need to know that one. Like at least for these algorithms, because you need to build these confidence balls, so you need to know the log. Right. So, right. So I, I guess lots of these things. Um, now the question is, what is a good notion of complexity of a function class? Right. So if you think of like the algorithms we are describing, how do they work? So you have a set of queries, and you have observed these values, right? Now suppose we are in say the noiseless scenario. So one reasonable thing is to define the you know the FT, like the F, I'll call it here Fn, uh, version space of so the set of functions that agree with the data as the Fs such that uh, they agree with the historical queries I have made. Okay, so so the intuition of what would be a class that is hard is one for which if I have made let's say these queries. There is a, a point that I can add to this sequence such that there are two Fs in the version space. So two Fs that agree with the historical data that have large difference in the new query points. Okay, so as long as this is happening, uh, I have not learned F very well yet. Okay, does that make sense? So we have seen these queries, we have seen these values. Now what does it mean that you have not learned F star very well is when the Fs that agree with the data contain an F, an F prime, with both of which could be F star. And there's a point where these two Fs are far. So that means that you have not figured F star very well because in particular, for this point, you don't know the value. Like there are two different values, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this could be shrinking and that's right. But you know, it could still be, for example, let's say uh, it could be that it's not a single point yet, and and like there is no such point. I mean, like all of these are are different or small. And in that case, maybe you're fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what we observed here is our dot yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm simplifying it for. Yeah, I'm just sort of simplifying it here for like kind of intuition. So, right, right. Yeah, so let's think of it for, because it gets more complicated when there's noise. So let's say in the no noise scenario, what what is an F, sorry, F, that is hard to learn is one where, you know, let's say you have made a bunch of queries or, and there is still a point that is unexplained by the historical data. And, Basically, that's sort of the, the basis of the idea of Eluder dimension. We're going to try to maximize over all these possible sets of queries and define a notion of uh, dimension that way by thinking of the largest subsequence of queries that satisfies some property like this. But I'll define it in a second. So, so let's you know let's think of uh, the the least squares algorithm that we are we were introducing, right? So the idea is that. Let me define first epsilon independence, and this will give rise to what is called a Luder dimension. Um, okay. So, but the intuition of hardness, just remind, uh, remember the, um, the previous slide. Okay. So, what we're going to say is that an action is epsilon independent on previous actions if there are two x, so that the square error, because now we're thinking of the noise case as well, the square error is small. Okay, so the 
the square error of these two, the, the square difference, the distance in the data historically for these two Fs is small, but the value of these two Fs in the, in the new action is large, okay? So that's an action that's epsilon independent of a historical sequence. This is related to the fact that like, we're using square loss in the noisy case as well. And so, okay, so this, this is towards uh, eluder dimension and this concept was introduced in 2013 by Russo and Van Roy in a paper. And, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but the notion of eluder dimension has been really the only way in which people have shown bounds for function approximation regimes for enforcement learning bandits since that time. There are new developments in other areas recently, but roughly speaking, that's what has been happening. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's what we are going to. Yeah, we're going to fix this later on. But here is just a notion of: Are there two functions? So if I give you some actions, are there two functions such that for that new action, the functions agree in the data norm? Uh, there's a small data norm difference, but have large prediction difference in the new act. So then Euler dimension is just defined as the length of the longest sequence of elements in the action space for the given function class, such that every action in that sequence is epsilon independent of its predecessors. So think of it as like, you know, you have this sequence such that Every AI is epsilon independent of the previous ones. Okay. So that kind of is saying that we're going to try to define the dimension of F to be the largest sequence that, if I were to encounter, um, I cannot fit to, to perfection, let's say, the, the F. So there's always something that's unexplained for the next action. And what you can show is that, for example, for linear, Function classes, the eluder dimension as defined as this combinatorial quantity that perhaps a bit has hard to grasp is O of D, D is that the ambient dimension of the space, which is what you would want. And same thing for generalized linear models. So the, the sad thing is that there are not many examples beyond this of eluder dimension being manageable, which kind of prompts the question whether you know this is a meaningful notion of dimension beyond these two examples, yeah. Right. So the threshold of silent? Right. So I guess in some way, the way we fix it, and you'll see it in like the next slide, maybe takes that into account and you can see that. But um, also one, one comment here is that the bound that appears in, when you try to analyze optimistically squares using a little dimension is setting epsilon to one over T. So you don't need to, so, so it is not a, it's not changing. It's just like a, this fixed epsilon because that, uh, that makes the error in the square loss to be like one of a T. But um, yeah, so this is the paper. And I think, so I, okay, then like lots of work here. I think the problem is, I think I had the bounds at the very end, but we'll, we'll see them in a second. Let me see if I can, oh yeah, here. Okay, so this is the kind of optimistic least square bounds you get. So if there is no noise, you just play this, okay? And if there is noise, you play something like this, where this is the ruler dimension, one of a T, right? And this is log F. This is the noise, the thing you have to pay for the least squares, the uncertainty in least squares. Okay, this is the kind of bound you get. Uh, yes, I mean, just, I think I'm going to skip this, but just really, really, really quickly. So the way in which you prove a bound for a little dimension is you, you apply optimism, then you offer bound this quantity by this maximum that's called width. And then you can show like this, so the main lemma is that you can show the sum of the widths by relating them to a little dimension is upper bounded by this quantity, which is the regret, okay? 
So I'm almost done, I guess, but now I'm actually going to introduce the, the, the fix. So what's the problem, right? So when we are trying to analyze the optimistic algorithms using a looser dimension, well, the issue is that the queries are not actually arbitrary in an optimistic algorithm. So the queries we make when we use optimism are such that the this value, so this arm, the thing, is an optimistic action of a model, right? So that is not really taken into account here. So it could be that, for example, like this X and the hard point that comes in the sequence has actually a very low value. But that may not matter, right? Because if it's a very low value for all models that remain, then you are not going to actually pick it by an optimistic algorithm. No, right, no, right. In the general case. So like linear, of course, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, like back to the wedge function class. So because I'm running a bit short uh, in time, but what you can show is that the eluded dimension of this wedge class is actually, you know, for a given epsilon is one over epsilon. So you can lower bound it by that. That is because if you look at, for example, this kind of sequence of queries where the blue points, so this is a, a sequence that certifies the lower dimension is large. So if I have these queries spaced at epsilon distance and I have my wedges, um, you know, having like slope two, then I can always find two models that agree in all the historical queries of the blue and the other model, but have a difference of epsilon in the next one, or at least epsilon. Now what happened is like, this query point is not really an optimum for, for, for a wedge that agrees with historical data. That's the problem that we're going to fix. But if you're trying to ask a little dimension, this will tell you that it's unlearnable. Because when you use one of a T, this becomes T, which means that if you plug this in the bound, you get something vacuous. For this very simple function class, right? <laughs> but if you think of what optimism does, when let's say there's zero noise in the wedge class, uh, well, optimism actually learns this really fast because what optimism does is if you have seen these historical queries, then all models that, are, let's say they're all zero, all models that agree with these queries have an optimum that's at least one, let's say, you know, the, the width of the wedge away from the previous ones. So that's kind of back to the Euclidean part of the, of this wedge class. So optimism itself uses the fact that like there is a distance between an optimum and a, and a query that is zero. And so the queries that optimism does would, will be very spaced out. So what this says is that, so if we just look at what optimism does by just kind of computing it on the wedge function class, it actually in the noiseless case requires very little samples to, to learn. Right. So here, you know, the reason. Yeah. Right. So here, to stress it, that the wedges have width like one eight. So I'm, I'm thinking of that scenario. Yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess like what I'm getting at here is that I'm analyzing a specific class of algorithms, so like optimism, optimistic algorithms. And it turns out that optimistic algorithms for let's say these wedges of like fixed width, the, the queries are so far apart by the by you know the algorithm itself does that. Uh, so we need to fix okay, the, this is another class, but we'll fix it. And what, what we'll do is we'll define this. Um, let me see if you can see it. Right. So yeah, the, I guess the thing that is missing in, in the eluder dimension is that the, the hard point. For example, in optimism, is really a point for which there is a model that agrees with the data that is optimistic. So that's not baked into the definition of a looter dimension. So what we'll do is instead we'll define this um, this notion of sequences that are dissimilar, that is more compatible with optimism. So we'll we'll say that a sequence is of functions and actions. Now we need the functions that certify, basically think of them as the, the functions that certify optimism. Functions and actions, uh, and we call them dissimilar if, so the alpha is alpha star, if the self-evaluations, so the f of 
FJ of AJ is large, just optimistic. And uh, basically, they agree with the history, but for technical reasons, is is the other definition. What this means is that there is a there is a C value that is way below alpha, so like for which all the all the historical functions, so like J, the, the model at time J evaluates an action in previous time steps close to that value. So think of it as this as like this fits the data, the historical data properly. Okay. And this root n is just so that we can compare with the loader. Okay. So this is kind of saying the historical actions have all very small values, but the current action has self, large self evaluations. So what we can show is that the so considering then a dimension that corresponds to the largest dissimilar sequence that we can produce in F, we can show the following uh, uh, things. Well, first that, uh, well, in general, that dissimilarity is always less than a loader. And then second, that for this example, for uh, in particular for these examples, we have the following relationship. Dissimilarity is, uh, D in linear classes uh, is O of one, is, for example, the wedge class, where uh, the Luder instead here is one over epsilon. And then the wiggle wedge that I didn't introduce, but the Luder can be unbounded, where the similarity is constant. Okay. Um, so I'll skip this, but you can show by just using ranks and some very nice argument that the dissimilarity dimension, as I described before, of linear classes is D. By relating the rank of a matrix with uh, the, the the length of the maximum dissimilar sequence, quite a nice proof. But then, as I mentioned, we can show that this new notion of dimension that is more aligned with optimism is always lower bounded by lower bounds the Euler dimension, and we can also get an upper bound for the exact same algorithm I presented to you, the optimistic least squares. I should actually call it optimistic least squares because OLS is online least squares, but um, that satisfies the following upper bound. So here now we have a 1.25 dependence on the dissimilarity dimension, um, both for the noiseless and the noisy case. But in some cases, this um, can be much better than the upper bound for a loader, particularly, for example, in cases like the wedge class, the wiggle wedge class, and others where a loader is actually overestimating the statistical complexity of a function class. Uh, but where optimism can still work well. And, you know, I talked a lot about optimism, but optimism has its limitations. So think of this very simple threshold class. So if you just act optimistically, uh, you can see that an optimistic algorithm can actually take infinite queries to learn this very, very, very simple class because optimism may not use the geometry of this class very well. So optimistic algorithms are not sort of the end all for, for bandits. Um, and uh, so that leads us to what is there to do? So, uh, well, so, you know, I introduced this dissimilarity dimension that provides us with sharper bounds for optimistic algorithms for structured bandits uh, than sharper than a Luder dimension. But, you know, we still have the 1.25 exponent. Can we sharpen them? Can we sharpen the definition of dissimilarity? Can these bounds be then brought into contextual bandits, reinforcement learning, where in lots of those scenarios where you talk about function approximation, everyone uses a Luder, but the Luder is not very good because it's not really capturing how optimism works well in some cases. Uh, so for example, optimistic algorithms may work sometimes with neural networks. So can we show something in that scenario, right? Uh, and then how do we port these results to better analyze things like Thompson sampling and other uh, empirically more successful algorithms that just simple optimism? And I guess maybe someone mentioned this, but you know, regret is not the only measure of optimality or um, objective that you may have in, in bandits and reinforcement learning. So there are other things like just pack, thinking of at the end of an interaction, produce a good policy. So can we come up with other combinatorial dimensions that capture the complexity of those different forms of objectives? And with that, well, thank you so much.
And if you have any questions or you want to contact me for anything, you can use these emails. And uh, yeah, so any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. Perfect.